Welcome back to Ensuring Success, or welcome if you're just joining us now. I'm Gail Perry, Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine, and we are coming to you live from Dallas. Uh, we are in our fourth session of Ensuring Success, and this session is going to be about client collaboration, but before we get started, I want to make sure to thank our sponsors who make this event possible. So our sponsor list this year includes ADP, Ace Cloud Hosting, CPA Charge, Avalara, BotKeeper, ComplyRight, CorePay, CoreV, CPA.com, eFile for Biz, Intuit, QX Global Group, Right Networks, Safe Send Returns, Sage, Suralink, TaxFile, Vic AI, Walters Kluwer, and Zero. And we are here because of all of our sponsors who are making this event possible. And in particular, this session is sponsored by Safe Send Return. So we especially want to thank them for allowing us to provide great information to you, as we've been trying to do all day. Um, I want to point out how CPE will work for this session if you plan to collect CPE credit for this session, we will display three codes at the bottom of the screen during this session. I'll call attention to them. Each code is a three-digit number, and you'll need to write down each one of those three-digit numbers. Then at the end of the conference, or whenever you're ready to collect CPE, go back to the insuringsuccess.com homepage, and at the top of that page, there's a link that says Get CPE Credit. You can click that, enter the codes that you've collected for every session you've attended, and download your certificates. Also, look for in your mail next week a virtual tote bag, which is an email you'll be getting from us, which includes offers and information from all of our sponsors for this event. So keep an eye out for that. It'll be coming to you within the week from CPA Practice Advisor. Um, also, I just want to point out one other thing. On your screen, under the video, if you scroll your screen down, there's an option for you to ask a question. So if you have any questions about the event or if you have any questions for our speakers, you can go ahead and enter a question there, and we'll try to bring your questions into our session to uh, encourage more of an interactive conversation. Okay, I'd like to introduce this session and our speakers. The session is called Automating Client Collaboration Using Technology to Serve Your Clients Even Better Than Before. And our speakers include Shana Chapman, Chris Brown, and Andrew Hatfield. I'm going to have Shana and Chris introduce them for themselves first as they're here in the studio with me. Andrew is coming to us remotely, so I'll put him on next. But Shana, let's start with you. Well, thanks, Gail, for having me. My name is Shana Chapman, and I am a CPA from Gallup Police, Ohio, and I own a firm, Shana Co. LLC. Chris? I'm Chris Brown. Uh, I was on a session earlier, and just kudos to, to you guys for, you know, I got to go sit in the back for a little bit, but you guys have been out here the whole whole morning and the rest of the day, and, I, and you guys are awesome for just sticking out here in the lights, so <laughs> you guys are doing awesome. But Chris Brown, I was in public accounting for uh, almost 12 tax seasons as an audit manager and went to work for a client, a, a medical college back in March. So now I'm on the client side of it. Just went through my first audit as a client. So I could, got a little bit of perspective now from both sides. Okay. And uh, we understand Andrew will be joining us shortly. He is not with us yet. So we're going to start out by just asking you guys what you see as the, the key, most important issues about communicating with your clients and how those things may have changed during the pandemic. Do you want to start? Yeah, I can. Uh, definitely, I think, from the audit perspective, uh, for sure, of, you know, most of the time we had blocked off, here's the time we're going to be out at the client's office. You didn't have to worry about if you were getting enough face time with the client or um, that relationship building time, whereas now we've gone remote, we've gone virtual, and making sure that your firm is, you know, a lot of firms, were, it was an easy pivot. They had already set up a lot of the technology. They had set up uh, the, the tech stack to be able to do that and then there were a lot of firms uh, that were not ready and they had to, to make a change really quickly so I think that was the biggest change of how do we how do we build our relationships how do we keep in contact with our clients we talked a little bit about that uh, backstage earlier of of how it changed right on the on the fly like that so that's the I think the biggest uh, obstacle that a lot of these smaller firms have have had to deal with the last 18 months 
Yes, I, I agree with that. We have, um, our clients are not necessarily as technologically adept as some accounting firms are. So not only did we have to worry about what accounting firms um, needed to do to make the change, but also how how could we get our clients to make those changes as well. And, and even if we may have already been starting to do things a little differently pre-pandemic, we were thrown into it when the pandemic started. And, and not only then did we as firms have to make some changes so that we could communicate, because we couldn't communicate any longer like we had been, um, but we had to get our clients on board in communication as well. And so how do we do that? And, and it, it, was, um, it was an interesting process from both the accounting firm side and I think the client side to make sure that we could pull that together. Yeah, a little background. Uh, my firm, which we had a lot of, we're a re we were a regional size firm, a larger firm, uh, but in rural Arkansas. And Shana's in a rural area as well. So we're talking about some of these smaller clients that, didn't, that weren't there yet, that didn't, didn't even have internet access or the ability right. to make that pivot quickly. So not only, like she said, helping ourselves get to that point, but helping our clients get to that point as well. Was there any pushback from clients? Was, were there difficulties in making that happen? There definitely was on our side, for sure. One of those was just plain logistics, like he was saying. Um, but also, they're just not used to it. It's, they, there are a lot of clients, granted, there are some younger clients that are ready to do everything electronically. You want to communicate electronically, fantastic, they're in. But we still have a lot of business owners and, and just plain old 1040 clients that they're not ready to make that transition. They've never done it that way. We're not going to change now. So there was a little pushback. That being said, as the pandemic <coughs> progressed, they had to communicate. <laughs> they weren't given the option. So not only was, while there was pushback, there was opportunity. And to take advantage of that opportunity and change the way we did things with them and, and to present it in a light of, we, get, we have to do it. Um, we were able to make those make those things happen. But yeah, there was pushback for sure. And I think there's, but there's also push from other industries. Like we're not the only industry or profession that had to do this. You know, your clients were also getting pushed by their insurance companies, their lawyers. Uh, they were watching church virtually. You know, they, it wasn't like we were the only ones pushing them towards this. So they, they had to figure it out one way or the other. Yeah. So I think this is a good time to ask our audience whether they're using these kinds of client collaboration tools. I know I know a lot of them are using them internally. So this is going to be your next polling question. It's at the bottom of your screen. Again, if you don't see it, just hit refresh and you will just see chat to be able to type in your name. Once you've done it once, you should be able to see all of the polling questions. So the question is, do you use a collaboration platform with your clients? The choices are yes. We use Zoom, Teams, Slack, something like that. Uh, second choice is email only, and the third choice is email and meeting in person. So we'll give you guys a couple minutes to fill that out, and we'll continue the conversation. Okay, well, we're waiting for you to, uh, to give us some poll results to see how our audience is communicating with clients. We have been joined by Andrew Hatfield, um, who's also going to be sharing his information and experiences about client collaboration. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Gail. Hi to everyone else. By the way, I liked your mug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as is the fashion uh, during COVID, I am here on Zoom uh, joining. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was the only one in the studio when everyone else was on Zoom, and now it's, it's flipped the opposite for me. But thanks for having me. Uh, Andrew Hatfield, I'm a co-founder and current chief growth officer for SafeSend. All right, thanks. And Andrew, one of the questions we discussed before you were able to join us was what what you see as what our panel sees as the the key uh, issues surrounding the concept of client communication. So would you like to weigh in on that? Sure. I, I caught the tail end of the conversation. And first of all, I'd like to say that I agree uh, with the comments from the other panelists. There are there were some and I say a small percentage of, of folks that were prepared. Uh, they were kind of the forward uh, movers and shakers with technology and collaboration. And, you know, a lot of us had been using a GoToMeeting or some of these technologies for virtual conferencing for a while because that was kind of in play to some degree. Uh, but we were still doing most of our interaction in person. And what was really difficult was for those that hadn't really adopted those technologies to be able to shift because they had to. And I think, as I heard earlier, 
Uh, I agree with the comment. There was some resistance. Uh, we saw some resistance from some people that just didn't want to do it. But ultimately, the intersection of uh, pandemic and technology crossed, and they were thrust into it, uh, where I heard another comment from one of the panelists about it's not just your CPA who might have asked you to have a virtual meeting or use an e-sign uh, solution to sign in 8879. It was your insurance agent and a whole other uh, number of people that were in your life that you had to communicate with, and there was no other option. So I saw a lot of, a lot of firms and a lot of folks grumble about it, uh, have a little discomfort with it. Um, but you know what? As we progressed, I saw a lot of folks get through it and adopt it, and I think they're going to expect it. Uh, at least some percentage of your clients are going to expect that you have those technologies in place because once you adopt it, you find out that it is better uh, in a lot of regards for certain situations. Not to say we shouldn't be back in person, and I love that, but I think technology is here to stay in a bigger way, especially around collaboration. So, so how do you keep and handle all of those different channels now? So you're having the email communications, you're having the phone communications, you're having the Slack or the Teams, and now how do you figure out where the heck was this document or what am I, where, where should I find all this? Yeah, I think it's important to set with the clients from the beginning what your firm sees as preferred communication channels. And so, especially if you have new clients, it's, it's easier because you set that expectation as soon as you get them. You say, okay, this is how we communicate, and this is what we expect. And we do that as soon as we set up the engagement. It's part of our engagement letter. This is how we expect you to, to communicate and collaborate with us, and, if you, and we'll teach you how to do that. And, and I think as long as you're upfront about it, clients um, will, especially in the, if they're new clients, they say, okay, great, then that's what, we, that's what we're gonna do. But the older clients that are used to communicating in all kinds of ways, telephone, uh, the, the email, all the ways, and some of them even want to instant message you on social apps. And you're like, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> like, yeah. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, yeah, you have to manage it, I think, by being really upfront with your clients and setting out rules by saying, this is what we need you to do not only for safety purposes, but because we can streamline that process and involve more people in it to make sure you're taken care of in the fastest, most appropriate way. And as long as you phrase that to your clients in the proper way, they generally will pick up on it and run yeah. the right way, I think. So Andrew was laughing when I posed this question. What do you, what do you have, what can you add to well, this? I, well, I, 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 I hear there's, there's kind of a different way to look at it too. I think there are some firms that have made a choice. They've actually pushed through uh, to use more of these collaboration technologies. And I think that there's some firms that are saying, hey, if our clients don't adopt something that allows us to have this flexibility, I'm not sure that I wanna have those kind of clients. And then there's other firms that say, gosh, I really have, some of my clients are going to do this and I need to, to get there and do it. I think the firms that are gonna be in trouble are the ones that don't adopt and they, they, they hold back and they say, no matter what, we're just not going to go um, out and adopt some of the things that could make life easier, like eSign, uh, the virtual meeting technology, some of the platforms for exchanging documents with their clients, the tax engagement process, et cetera. They're going to have a certain percentage of clients that didn't care about that before who now absolutely want that to be in place. And I think that's going to cause some concern. And I think you're going to have clients potentially um, go down the road somewhere else to find it. But I did hear a few firms actually say, I'm not sure I want clients that don't adopt this anymore because they found it to be so convenient uh, for their flexibility, especially with the staffing issues and having to, to also be very flexible in where our staff works today uh, to be able to compete in the talent pool. Okay, we're gonna take a, a quick break just for a moment to hear a word from our sponsor, Safe Send Returns, and when we come back, we'll have the first CPE code for you for this session, so we'll be right back. My name is Benji Kramer. I am the Senior Manager of IT Services at Friedman & Huey Associates. Um, one of my roles is to focus on all of the technology needs and innovation that we have at Friedman & Huey Associates. And uh, I've been doing this for about seven years and working for the firm for 11. So I think within the last year and a half, 
we've seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has really accelerated digital transformation. And in a positive, in a positive way, it really forced our team um, to adapt and meet client needs. And so that in, included changing parts of our workflow um, because we were working apart. And without SafeSend as a tool, you know, it, it really would not have worked out as well because people are used to their paper processes or visiting an administrative team member at a front desk or in their office and saying and, and providing them with some information. But, you know, now that we were working apart and forced to make these changes, um, using SafeSend just definitely, it, it, it really standardized how we had to go through our assembly process because everybody was a part so we all had to follow the same procedures to get a return to assembly and out the door. I think it also eliminated a lot of inconsistencies in our existing processes because we what we were able to change in our tax workflow was you, you take your tax return, you print your copy, and you save it to a specific location that's on a shared network drive, and then our administrative team members would have access to it. Um, what used to happen some people would print the paper and drop it off. Some people would email the file. So now putting in place um, one very specific process, we were able to really eliminate those inconsistencies and standardize our, our, our workflow. Welcome back. And we would like to display right now the first CPE code for this session. You'll see it on the bottom of the screen. If you plan on collecting CPE for this session, you'll need to record all three codes. This is the first code. There will be two more later on in this session. Um, and I think we have polling results, right, Alexander? We do, and I'm actually surprised at this. So 52% said that they are using Zoom, Teams, and Slack, 40% um, this is what was surprising to me. Said so they're only they're doing email and meeting in person, and only seven percent said email only. Okay, interesting. So we're moving more, at least we, at least temporarily, we move, moved more into a, a world of more electronic communication with our clients. And um, I, I know personally, I have a, a small tax practice myself, and uh, there was a bit of a hurdle until my clients found out how easy it was to actually send me stuff and mm -hmm. sign things online and um, and they really like it for the most part. So I'm curious to know uh, where you guys stand in terms of what you've heard from uh, clients uh, or even colleagues who have moved to more of an electronic communication format and what, their, what the responses have been uh, and whether or not clients are liking it and, and in what way. Yeah, I, th I think the benefit, obviously, you went from all those clients having to, you know, just the effectiveness and efficiency and, and some time saving of not, them not having to come into the office and bring their folder and, and get it logged in at the front desk and the front desk scanning it all to go onto the shelf or, you know, go into a, a file cabinet in the back for the, the accountant to come pull and just the, the time saving of them making a trip or you making a trip or uh, you having to go through all that information and just the the time savings and also the I guess oh, I'm kind of going blank here uh, <laughs> I had something and then it went phew. it's been a tough year <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah Andrew how well I was thinking was safe sin or sure sure link that we had earlier some of those uh, folks, they make it so easy for the client and the CPA to collaborate where uh, it's just, it's not difficult to figure it out from either side. It mm -hmm. makes it a lot quicker and easier. And to me, I think that was a problem originally, and I think Andrew can probably speak to that, but I, I think when we first started trying to set up portals and share information with clients online, mine certainly rebelled. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. generally the reaction was, I don't get it. You know, you sent me this link uh, from a, from a third party, and it doesn't make sense. And can't can't I just email you my W two? Yeah. How, <laughs> how 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 many of us uh, out in the audience have tried to use a portal and had a client uh, or clients inundate them with I can't remember my password, I can't log into it, and they go in this circle of frustration where they finally get to the point of 
just email me the document. Mm-hmm. I, you know, just, I need the information. I'm, I'm going through a refi and I just need to copy my tax returns from a few years ago. Um, so I think technology started off in the right way to be paperless and, and portal started off more of, of online, you know, paperless client facing uh, storage of documents. And they kind of progressed into uh, what they are today, but really they were large file exchange programs, getting large files back and forth and having some client facing storage where clients could access the documents they needed. The problem is, is that, you know, back in the day, there were no text to phone codes. There were, the technology hadn't caught up. And, and for a lot of this, I'm telling you, the passwords were just problematic in the beginning for clients. And as a client, I was very frustrated with passwords with my uh, CPA firm's portal. And, you know, it's a real turnoff. And when you get frustrated with technology and if it's not thought through enough for the client, uh, it kind of turns your clients in a direction of we don't want to use it. And it's not just technology from the firm. It's technology from, as we mentioned earlier, from, uh, you know, medical and from insurance and from all of these other areas that are pressing these portals uh, down onto the, the client base. And if you have a bad experience, you're, you're less likely to want to commit to the next thing that the firm asks you to do. And I think that that was problematic in the beginning. And I think most of us could agree if we'd adopted a portal, not picking on portals, just something that a lot of the industry had adopted early. Um, they were frustrated and problematic for clients. I think also the portals were clunky in the beginning. They just they were just hard all the way around. It was hard to figure out where you were supposed to go and what to do. We we implemented portals and then we got rid of them because it just the clients it was just such a pain that we just were like it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. So then to bring it back again, the it's changed so much over the years on how it works. It's so well, it's intuitive to me. Maybe, and then the clients they have to work a little bit to get to it. But, but it ends up being fairly intuitive for them once they get in. And so, getting them to put things into a portal has been really nice. But getting them to understand that they don't have to show up anymore to pick up a tax return, or that they don't have to meet with us. It turns out that some of my clients are actually extremely happy they don't have to come to my office, <laughs> whereas all this time I thought you know, because they were older and have been clients for 20, 30 years, that they were um, so used to coming in, I didn't want to hurt their feelings. But they actually like it now that they're like, oh, you mean I don't have to come in? And they're like, no, you don't. <laughs> let me tell you how this works. And, and some of them are embracing them. And during this pandemic, too, let me say that a lot of their children have been helping them through. And so they've embraced it because the kids have realized that their parents need help. And um, it's made it a lot easier to get them to, to take advantage of it. So I want to flip the script on this, and then I want to a- ask another poll question that's related to this, because we've said that we've ha- we have a lot of these panels, and most of us are, as, as was said at the other panel, tech forward. A lot of you guys yeah. are kind of leading the way. But a lot of people on this, on, in the audience are not. Um, and so uh, the question is related to whether it's the, the clients that are driving this um, or so if, if you're a firm that's kind of behind and the clients are asking you to do this kind of thing, what can you do? So the question that the poll question is, where is your firm on the tech spectrum? Is it that you need to adopt some tech to maintain advanced clients? Is it that you want to attract new clients with your existing technology? Or are you just looking to be more efficient internally? So we'll launch that, but then I'm going to pose that question to you, Shana, to say, like, I know you're the one that's leading the way, but what advice would you give to firms that are not as tech savvy where their clients are more savvy than that? So what I would say is you really need to develop your tech stack and you need to think it through because this is a process from beginning to end and you want um, you want to be able to make it a smooth transition for you and your clients. So you need to do a little bit of research and things like this, what we're doing today and talking about um, different ways we use products and you're seeing lots of amazing products during the insurance success um, are an opportunity for you to to look at what they do. So start there, take a look, but consider everything that you need, not just one product. What's, I need something to communicate. I need something to deliver. I want to get my 8879 signed electronically. So think through all of that before you pick a product. And then if you really like a certain product, then try and build around that product. But but you really just need to do your research, lay out what your systems are, think about what you want to do, and build the tech stack that way. Yeah. 
You really need to need to grade yourself and your firm on that of where are we? If your client is the one that's pushing you, then you realize we're we're not in a great spot at the moment. And uh, yeah, make sure you get that grade on yourself and and move. And it does, and it's not just large firms that have to do this. You're in a you know even a, a three four person mm -hmm. firm, you can do this. It's it can be done. Yeah, and Andrew, I think, I, I believe it was you that was saying, you know, you went from having clients that were these huge clients that were at the forefront to having some clients that didn't even have email. So how were you educating them about this kind of thing? So so the first thing that we do is, uh, just uh, as, as was mentioned, we try to create a gradient scale for where the firm is at today because the most important thing is understanding where is the firm today? Because every firm is, is a little different on, you know, that needle of where they're at uh, with technology and collaboration. And so you have to understand that because the needs of somebody who doesn't uh, use email versus the needs of somebody who is got too much technology stack and actually needs to standardize the process by not having as many uh, virtual meeting applications. I mean, we go in some of these firms, they have four or five virtual meeting applications, two e-sign solutions. They've got, you know, all sorts of different things that we need to shrink down. Um, you have to understand where that firm is because it's a different conversation and it's a different journey for each firm, depending on where they are in that process. If you told me that we just use email, we don't have a portal, we don't uh, have any um, virtual meeting technology, we're not yet using eSign. The first thing we need to do is educate you on some of the hurdles that can exist in those programs so that you understand some of the challenges that you or your clients might have. And then we also need to shrink what you're gonna use those applications to do to start with. What's the most important function you need? And then as you become comfortable with that, expand it out from there. Uh, what I, my advice would be is, you know, there's a lot of good knowledge out there uh, to seek um, about these technologies. Talk to other firms. Um, you know, surely you're a part or a member of an association or society or something that you can reach out or you know another firm, reach out and talk to them about their journey and their experience because they can be very helpful with that learning curve. And at the end of the day, don't try to get overwhelmed by all of the buttons inside of an application. Like if you look at Outlook, we'll never understand everything that it does because maybe I just need to send an email. And then as I progress, maybe I need to use another one of the buttons or functions. And over time, you build out the value of that application, but just start small, start simple. If you're that kind of firm who's just starting the journey. Great advice, and and I, you know we forget sometimes back in the day when we didn't have all this technology, we used those. I remember the, like the Thomson Reuters discussion forums or the QuickBooks users discussion forums, and everyone wants to help each other. It's like a, just mm -hmm. a great community of people. So great advice. They really do want to help. You would think um, people still have this idea that I can't help you because we're competitors. Some people think that that's the way that still works, but it really doesn't. We help each other constantly, and you know Chris alluded to the fact that I'm a small firm in a small rural town and I've learned everything from peers. I've learned so much from peers, people helping me. And even, you know, in my own general area, I've helped, I've helped people, people have helped me. So if you look around, people are willing to help you. There's a lot of places to go. Yeah, got to get out of that scarcity mindset. I mean, that's what it is. There's, a, there's enough pie to go around. So having a growth mindset, not that scarcity mindset. And ask yourself those questions. Are these, is my tech stack what I have? Is it, is it helping or hurting the relationship with the client? Is it helping or hurting my efficiency and effectiveness to get the work done? Those are a couple more questions and grading areas that you can look at and say, is our tech stack doing that or not yet? We're gonna take another very quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we will give you the second CPE code for this session. So
Welcome back. And we would like to display on the bottom of the screen right now the second CPE code for this session. So be sure to write this down if you're planning on collecting CPE for attending this session. And I think, Alexandra, we have poll results. I do. And it looks like 70% of the respondents said that they're just looking to be more efficient internally. But 18%, interestingly, said they want to attract new clients with their existing technology. And 11% are just doing it to maintain the advanced clients. OK. And we've talked quite a bit about um, accountants and how they should be sort of leading the charge to push this out to clients and say, you know, we need to communicate this way going forward. Um, so, Chris, you've been on, well, you've been on both sides of the spectrum, having been in public accounting when COVID began and then became a client. So yeah. what's the client reaction to this kind of re request? Again, I think... I've, from the client side now, I've realized that, okay, as the client, I don't have uh, SafeSend or SureLink or ShareFile or, or these things that I can send things uh, securely, uh, something we need to talk to our t IT folks at the college about, but <laughs> making sure that my accountant has a way that I can get them information secure, securely, you know, I think data security is a big part of it. Uh, as far as a client, what do I, what, after uh, nine months now of what do I want as a client and what don't I want, I would say, um, right now, I probably don't need the uh, random newsletters or weekly or monthly update things as much. We were talking about that, you know, constant contact and some of that. Maybe maybe that's just because I was the auditor and I know where that stuff comes from, but I'm like, I, I really don't need that. Uh, I, what I do want in my audit team and my partner at, at the firm we use is, you know, 24-hour response. You know, if I send something, am I going to get a response in 24 hours? And is someone that I can bounce ideas off of. You know, that's what I want in my CPA and my advisor is someone who is an advisor. When I get the question from my CEO or my COO, hey, look into this, I want to be able to research it on my own, you know, pretty quickly, come up with what I think is the answer, and then I want to bounce it off my partner at the, at the CPA firm to say, here's what I'm looking into, here's what I think the answer is, can you just, you know, make me warm and fuzzy inside that I'm, and I'm on the right track. So quick responses uh, of someone who's, adding, you know, like we talk about, adding value, more than just giving me the audit report that, as the auditor, I thought was really important, but now as the client, I know it's just, you know, the thing that I have to have and then goes over here and I pull it out and, and look through it, or just the tax return or the, just the 990. I want, you know, as the client, I would need somebody who's, who's adding value to what we're doing. You know, and I think um, you made a good point in a statement that, um, that you, your company, doesn't have these kinds of software products. It really is the accountant's responsibility um, if they're going to provide a safe environment for the client to take the lead and make sure they've got whatever uh, product they need and then make sure the client knows how to use it. Yeah. We so. had, y'all were talking about data security back there a little bit related to, you know, in a small town and there's, a, there's only a few CPAs and there's some that you obviously have a, a nice tech stack and data security versus somebody down the street that's not really doing anything security-wise. Yeah, you have to worry about that data security, as you know, of course, with the IRS, and I'm sure Andrew can um, say this as well. Um, with the IRS, you have to have a security policy now with your tax returns and your tax preparation business. So how are you doing that? How are you getting this information? Is it secure? Do you have that data policy? And I think, is there a session about security we as well? We just finished it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so there, those are real concerns, and, and, it, and it goes hand in hand with communicating and providing your clients ways to get you information. I actually had a client try to send me a W-2 on social media messenger, and I was like, no, goodness <laughs> gracious, no, 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 no. You know, and, and I'd say, let me, let me send you a secure link so that you can send that back to me in email. And it's easy enough to do, but you really do have to worry about the data security. And from an accountant standpoint with my clients, providing you a portal that you can easily upload something into or providing you a communication system like a Teams or a Slack. If I have, mm -hmm. I do external communication within my team, so my clients have Teams in Teams so that you can talk to me in there and it's, it goes back and forth. That is a value added because you can talk to me 24 seven in, in a streamed format that's not an email that you can lose. And then we can have a conversation and you can attach files and you can mm -hmm. do things. 
you do, let me mention, have to be aware of what kind of client you have, and that could be an advanced conversation. If you have a medical client or something like that, there are other security concerns for those type of clients, but security is a real thing. Andrew, do you have, I can see you're nodding your head yes, so I'm sure yeah. you have more to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, gosh, there's so many points to make <laughs> on all that. But uh, let's start with security. Um, first of all, as a firm that's gonna adopt technology that's gonna put any information out on the internet or stored on external servers uh, in the cloud uh, that's going to be uh, collaborative with the client. Um, if it's got PI, you know, uh, personal information in it, which almost everything that we touch as accountants does, uh, you know, it needs to be secured. And, and there's a whole lot that goes into that. As you mentioned, you had a security session, you know, prior that probably got very detailed. But if you're going to make a bullet note, one thing that I would ask of any vendor who comes, uh, you know, to your firm and, and has technology to offer that does any of those things, I would ask them if they have a SOC 2 audit. It's a very, very simple thing to ask for. What that will do is it will, A, separate the companies that can't afford to do a SOC 2, which is a red flag um, on your, you know, personal <laughs> private data uh, that they're going to be securing or transferring. And the other is is that you get a report that shows findings around it. Um, and if they don't want to give it to you, that's a red flag. And then uh, obviously if they have it, you can review it. And what that'll detail is all the things that we should be doing to ensure that we're securing everything uh, as, a, as a vendor to you on our backside in our cloud uh, in the exchange with your clients um, from an encryption, a transfer of documents and data to an encryption at rest on servers where the data might reside, et cetera. So that's a very simple ask. Um, and you don't have to be an expert in security to ask that question, and that'll kind of get you down the road where you need to go. The, the other uh, point that I was going to make is the polling. We still had 70% of the audience that said, I want to become more efficient. So in the industry, you have firms that are really focused on internal efficiency, and they sort of move to this, how do we become more collaborative with our clients and win the engagement with the client? You also have, obviously, 70% of firms here that are saying, we still are seeking to become more efficient internally. And so software vendors as a whole have been focusing on firm efficiency for years and years and years. It's only over the last few years that you've started to hear this collaboration word being used constantly, which means that we're now more focused on getting the uh, transaction with the client to be successful, meaning the client doesn't get frustrated, they don't quit, they can do what we're asking them to do, and we focus a lot of development there. But if you're a firm that's just moving from paper to digital and you just want to save time and you might be thinking, I don't know if I'm going to have enough staff for this upcoming busy season, because that's a whole nother uh, topic out there that is problematic, then there are a lot of ways to improve efficiency. And it's uh, not reduction in necessarily staff, but it's also taking staff you have and putting them on high level tasks and getting rid of some of the manual tasks that they don't like doing anyway. For example, assembling returns. Um, or shuffling engagement letters and printing them out, packaging them and sending them, or uh, your organizers printing those, packaging them up, mailing them out. Uh, with SafeSend, we automate all of those internal tasks for engagement letters, uh, e-sign, um, you know, the assembly and delivery of tax returns, and cut that process way down and remove a lot of manual tasks. So there's vendors out there that are doing this, and you can seek efficiency there, thus offsetting maybe the labor shortage that's going on or taking people that you want to keep, and getting rid of some of the frustrating things that they do, administrators in particular I'm speaking to, and move them to higher level tasks. Um, but it sounds like there's a lot of firms still seeking efficiency internally and aren't quite there on the collaboration yet. Yeah. Um, I had a, several questions that came in about texting, which I'm going to uh, address to Shana because I know that you said that you don't particularly like it, but some people in your firm use it. Um, the, there were Some of them were just general questions, but one of them said, how do we handle a quick text question? And do you use an application for that? Um, this particular person said they save some info by capturing a picture on the cell screen. Like, this is getting a little crazy. How, what do you do? Yeah, so that's exactly the reason I don't love texting, but my clients like to text. So sometimes, you know, we text, but we do it over voice. Our voice over IP system has texting in it. And so I'll very, we direct them into the voiceover. They don't realize it, but they're texting our office phone number, not our personal cell phones. So they, and, and that's something that at 5 p.m. can turn off. So we're not getting texts when we're home. It's a different, it's a different thing. So um, 
how do you do those quick, how do you build those quick one-off tax or how do you deal with them? It depends on how you um, bill and how your engagement's set up. Is it something where you need to keep track of time and bill that? Do you have a pricing? And I think there's some pricing mm -hmm. classes that are going to be talked about here. Um, you know, is it, do you have it built in your pricing that you can do so much for so many hours or unlimited? So those are, that depends on how your firm prices. But as far as texting, if somebody is texting your personal cell phone, and again, I'm from a small town, so my friends are my clients, a lot of them. Um, so people have my personal cell phone number. I know I hear constantly from bigger firms are like, oh, my clients don't have my cell phone number. That is not true in a small town. We have each other's cell phone numbers. I try to very um, slickly move them over to the voice over IP system and say, hey, here's my work text number. And this one I actually pay attention to. During the day, I might set my personal cell on do not disturb, so I don't always get your text. But if you'll text me on my voice over IP system, I'll pick it up there. But in capture, I have to do the same thing. I screen capture because I don't know any great way, maybe somebody else does, to get that out of texting and get that over there, um, which is why I don't like it. But people in my office, um, that do bookkeeping, they text a lot, and they and they really like that. It's quick for them, and they love to do it. Maybe, maybe I'm a uh, a bad client on that then, because <laughs> because uh, my my partner and my audit team were all my coworkers for <laughs> ten years, so we all text each other all the time about everything, so, including uh, work stuff. So maybe we need to revisit that. I don't know if they're if they're uh, getting too many. Uh, work-related texts from me, maybe. <laughs> well, it's, um, at, from a client perspective, it's, are they stopping, like, at 5 o'clock, or are they texting yeah. you on Sunday mm -hmm. night at 9 p.m., especially about their tax return, and then you can't sleep at night because somebody texted yeah. you at 9 p.m. Yeah. on Sunday. And I've had that happen, so I'm speaking from experience, unfortunately. It's, it's forced in your face, just like, you know, I, I say, like, with being with COVID, where it's like, the computer was always sitting there mocking me when I, would, when I decided <laughs> that I wanted to, you know, watch TV for an hour or mm -hmm. something, because I was always home. Andrew, anything for you to add on that regard? I was just going to say that I mean, there's 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 a lot there's a lot of conversation around texting. First of all, I'm a huge believer in text notifications, so uh, I like text codes rather than passwords. You have to remember to access online systems, um, i.e., portals or etc. Um, I also like text notifications if it comes from certain people in my life that have really important information for me, like my CPA. I'd like to get a text notification about an estimated payment or that I need to return a document or that uh, a tax return's ready. So I like texting for, for alerts and I like texting for simple back and forth. I think giving out your personal um, number, that's just, well, it's a personal thing. I mean, some firms don't, obviously larger firms. I have clients that have that text me. Some of them I wish I hadn't given that to them 14, 15 years <laughs> ago. I have the same number. <laughs> but but we, we, tr we try to keep our communication. We go to messaging, so we try to do secure messaging platforms, um, and, and that works really well and get away from the texting. We love text alerts. We don't necessarily like giving out personal uh, phone numbers, and we don't like uh, private information that has you know uh, an aspect of data security around it being sent through a text message, especially a document or a screenshot. Um, we we kind of, you know, we we get no, no. <laughs> <on that one. laughs> it's not good, but people do it. I mean, it's convenient and, and I get it, but you, we kind of need to move our clients away from that. But I think a, a quick, um, a business phone number is a great idea, especially when it goes through your voice, voice over IP. And it does make sense for some communication. And that's the way most com people communicate these days is through text messaging. But keep the keep the the personal information and the document exchange out of it, and uh, try not to give me a personal number, uh, or you might get that text in the middle of the night that none of us enjoy. Okay. So, so go ahead. I was going to say we're still getting some uh, some queries from our audience uh, continuing about texting. I think this is a pretty popular topic. <laughs> Who knew yeah. how many of us were texting with our clients? But um, somebody asked, and I don't know if any of us have the answer to this, or if this something if this is something that SafeSend needs to work on, but. Somebody asked if there is a way to, in a text message, to attach a screenshot of something and make it secure before it gets sent. Anybody know the answer to that? We should have left those tech guys on the panel. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah should have left the tech guys on the panel. Um, so we like the, the concept of delivering a request 
through a text message, having them click the, the link in there and having that link be secured to transfer something back rather than going through the actual text message. Okay. For the client, uh, it's a very seamless experience. You get a text with a request for something, they click the link, it takes them immediately to something that they can open up and upload a document that's secure. So that's one way that, that we like to handle it. We are always looking at you know how secure can text messages be with attachments. I don't know that there's a perfect solution out there because at the end of the day, you can create programs that will do that on instant messaging uh, programs, for example, but then your client has to adopt something. To do it just traditionally through a regular text message, I think a link that opens up a secure site to have them go through the process um, is what you know we recommend today. But uh, you know things can change. We'd love to be able to do it without asking your client to do anything different than just send the text. But I, I don't know that that exists for us. I, mean, I know it doesn't exist for us, but I don't know if it exists out there somewhere. Can I add to that for a second is that you were talking about them having to adopt something else and that's the line that we ride um, between the text messaging and say, hey, can you download Teams to your phone or a or a, a portal system, just the app, and then you can send it through this secure app. You know, if you can, we we do use Teams rather extensively in my firm, and so we I would much rather have a running chat in Teams with my clients um, than a text message. So again, going back to what I was saying about engagement letters, if something's going to be a little larger of a conversation, I'll say, hey, let, can we move this? But I have the clients now that I've built, I've built these relationships and specifically built these kind of clients to make sure that they're going to use Teams. And so I, I, if it's a bigger question, I'll move them into a different format to have that conversation. But the one-off items, sometimes those come in via text because, yeah, that's what the client likes and a well, quick answer, no, no big deal. Um, but okay. you're right. I think we have to pause here for a second. Sorry, oh, sorry to cut you off. We do have one more quick break. Uh, a word from our sponsor, Safe Sound Returns, and then we will be back with the third CPE code for this session. So we'll be right back. Welcome back. I'd like to post the third CPE code on the screen right now. This is the code that you'll need with the, in conjunction with the other two in order to claim CPE. Just as a reminder, you'll, when you're done with the conference, you'll go to insuringsuccess.com insuring homepage and click the Get CPE option at the top of the page. You can enter all the codes you've collected from all the sessions you attend and download your certificates. And I think we have another poll right now. We do. And a, and a reminder, the poll questions are not connected to CPE. This is just so that we can engage and interact with you guys since you're not here in the studio with us. So um, the last poll question for this particular session is, do you feel like your relationship with your clients are better or worse as a result of technology? And the options are that it has improved, that you are losing personal touch because there's too much technology involved, or that you're just frustrated by clients who don't want to adopt. So we'll give you a couple minutes to answer that. And Chris, I believe you had something you wanted to comment on. Well, just that's the kind of that question that that grade we talked about earlier is is the technology helping or hurting your practice, your time with your clients? We've we've removed that that time of sitting down with our client face to face or going to the client's office in this remote world. 
is that hurting your relationship with your client? When it comes to the end of the day, how are you connecting with your client? And I think, I think there's going to be different answers. I think there's some clients who, if they adopt the technology correctly and you adopt the technology correctly, your relationship may be better over the last 18 months than only seeing them once or twice a year face to face compared to now you're connecting a lot more often and it's it's remote but it's still a better connection but there also may be those clients that that didn't adopt it very well and you haven't really seen or talked to them in either side so maybe going through that client list and and saying okay here's some people that I really need to follow up with and these are some relationships that are suffering or these are relationships that are that are that are thriving based on this and how do we fix it or like we like uh, Andrew said earlier if they're uh, if they're not going to get on board uh, saying okay these this isn't the kind of client that that I want anymore I just have to share this because it's funny. Um, I don't always share the audience comments, but one audience said about text, because I guess it's the hot thing. She said, I respond, or he said, I respond to the text with, you will receive a professional response in your email. Oh. Yeah, it's the redirection. <laughs> yeah. To redirect them. So, sorry, Andrew, I cut you off. What were you going to oh, say? No, that's great. No, no, that was a great point. Um, no, I was just going to say that as, as, a, as, a, as a client um, myself of a firm, I, I want to know my CPA. I, I want my CPA to know me, let me say, as well as they can. Because the more that they know me, the more that they know what's happening in my life, the more that they know about what I'm doing in business and personally, the better service, advisory, tax work, everything uh, they, that they can do for me is better because of that. Um, but to the point earlier, I've been able to engage a lot more using remote technology and collaboration because you know, even during COVID, whether I'm at home and I'm isolated or whether I'm traveling, um, the technology allows me to connect anywhere, anytime, any place. Uh, and, and so I think that's opened up the door for me to connect a lot more. But I, you have to have the mix. I still make the time to go and have the in-person lunch and have the, you know, dinner and everything like that, because that's really where the heart of the relationship is. But I think if you have a good mix, you can actually have a deeper relationship uh, adding technology into it. Good point. Great, and we, got the, we have the results <laughs> of the poll, and m m the large majority, 67%, said that their relationships have improved. 18% that said they're losing touch, and 14% are frustrated. And maybe some are so frustrated they didn't even want to answer the poll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've we've spent a lot of this session talking about transitioning our clients into a more. Um, Technolo technology forward world, I think, would be the description. And, and sometimes holding their hand and helping them move forward, making it easy on them. But we haven't talked a lot or at all, really, about bringing on new clients. So if you're, you're spending a lot of time bringing older clients into the 21st century, what about um, taking on a new client? And you can go right out of the gate and say, this is how we do our business. So what kind of tools do you need to have in place in order to have that practice for your clients going forward. And Andrew, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, well, I think from, from, a, from a firm perspective and a staffing perspective, we've always talked about digital natives, meaning if you want to attract younger talent into your firm, you have to be, you have to have a digital footprint to get a digital native, somebody who's grown up using eSign and Zoom. And so it works the same way for your clients. And as you attract those younger clients into your firm that you'll have for, you know, X number of years, uh, a lot of those clients are just simply going to expect it. Look, I'm not going to be your client if you don't have the option for me to sign things when I'm traveling electronically or somewhere that I can access my documents or upload them to you or jump on a Zoom meeting. Um, it's just not going to work for me. So. I'm not even a digital native, but I've now been around it so long. That is my expectation. And I think that firms are going to have to have for a percentage of their clients. And obviously, eventually, it's going to be all of our clients. I mean, this is a moving uh, in this direction, not in this direction kind of thing. So one day, if your firm's going to be around, you're going to have all your clients that expect these things, and it's just going to be the norm. Jaina, how about you bringing in new clients? What are you telling them? Yeah, so we're explaining our tech stack right up front. Our tech stack is we expect you to use this bookkeeping, depending on the service, we yeah. expect you to use this bookkeeping service. We expect you to understand that this is where your t tax returns will land in a portal. We expect you to communicate using 
this platform we expect. So we just set it right up and we actually put it in the engagement letter. You know, this is your tech stack. This is what we are. We look for you to use. And I think that that just defines it right up front. And if you do that, when the rules are laid out, people are, are more apt to just go right with it because that's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Build that into your onboarding, client yeah. onboarding process and make sure you have a client onboarding process. Yeah. With training, we provide training too. So if you've never used Teams, we want to run you through how Teams is going to work and explain that to you, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever you're using. Excellent. Any parting comments, any of you? Andrew, any last thoughts? Um, yeah, everybody should uh, go out and take a look at SafeSend. <laughs> would, would be would be the number one thing. No, honestly, um, look, if you buy a product from us or not, uh, just speaking very transparently, right now with firms that are trying to get where they need to go from technology, whether you buy anything from us or not, you're, you're more than welcome to contact SafeSend. We've got great advice. Um, we're not the only product out there. There's lots of good products. We're happy to give you the information that we know. We're happy to tell you about associations and alliances that you can join to get more educated uh, in, the, in technology. And we're also happy to connect you with firms that can give you some information on what they've done and, and what where their road has led them. Um, and I think everybody needs to do that right now to encourage and help firms that are behind the curve. All right, and I would just add too, to, and someone had commented about this, which which made me think about it, but don't lose the personal touch, even though you're using more technology, make sure you still are providing the clients with the kind of relationship they want to have in order to feel like you're taking the best care of them possible. No doubt. All right, well, I wanna thank our panel. Thank everyone for participating in this session. Thank you, Safe Send Returns, for sponsoring this session. We are about to take a one hour break, so we will be back at the top of the next hour an hour from now with our next session, which is going to be on hiring challenges and how to position yourself to be the employer of choice. So we will see you in an hour. Thank you, everyone. Are you ready for e-filing your forms with e-file for biz? e-file for biz is an easy to use full service solution for e-filing, printing and mailing your information reports, including 1099 and W-2 forms. The intuitive interface walks you through completing your forms quickly, efficiently and securely. You can bulk upload and edit forms easily. We even have an inline TIN checking option to help you ensure your filings are flawless. We've got the 1099 NEC form for reporting independent contractor earnings, as well as other 1099 forms, W-2s, and even ACA forms. Our customers choose us because we've taken the hassle out of filing and sending your forms. We are an authorized IRS transmitter, we're SOC 2 certified, and HIPAA compliant. We offer multi-factor authentication, use data encryption, and adhere to strict protections and procedures to keep your data secure. There's never been a better time to trust eFile for Biz for e-filing, printing, and mailing your 1099s and W-2s. Set up an account for free, no credit card needed. You only pay when you're ready to file. Whether you are looking for full-service e-file, print, and mail, or e-file only, we've got you covered.